So thank you everyone. And uh, thank you of course to Stefan and the DGI for this year and organizing this. I am David Maria Lombardo and I was a boost fellow here during the, this, uh, this last year, 2022. And today I'm gonna to talk about uh, the work I completed here, mostly in collaboration with my PhD advisor, Professor Francesco Rivo. And uh, it is in the field of particle physics and mostly as a general idea is grounding on effective field theory and in particular on deriving what are the constraints from some assumption for the high energy model we consider on the low energy, let's say IR, effective field theory we, we study. So let's start from the, the grounding idea. As I was saying, if we can think of uh, extending a standard model, for instance, imagining that new physics is hidden in the UV, so at very high energy with respect to the one that we are used to in particle physics, and uh, can be characterized, for instance, by a new scale hem that is larger of the usual physics, let's say the scale of the standard model. The most effective, probably, or for sure, a very convenient way to modelize such a physics is uh, effective field theory, meaning uh, a low an expansion around the low energy theory. We are represented by the Lagrangian with energy dimension less or equal than four. That includes other terms, new terms that parameterize new possible interaction that arise from the new physics here at the scale m higher than the one we know. So for instance, here in this picture, you have the propagation on an EV state with mass m that can be represented by this contact interaction in the effective low energy theory. Here in formulas, you see that uh, the stand standard model or dimension four low energy Lagrangian is augmented by a tower of new interactions whose importance is given by these uh, coefficients, these numbers, the Wilson's coefficients given the magnitude. So these are important not only because they actually represent what uh, this model has to fit in order to reproduce the data, but also because they give the importance of these terms, leading them to the accessible information at low energy, I mean, on the UV physics. So we, we started from this point, we understand that this actually is the object to study in such a model. And we focus, oops, sorry. We focus on this study. And in particular, we wanted to see if those numbers, this C, are actually totally arbitrary. Or you can, in the sense that every given model is possible to befit on the low energy data, or if there is a way to restrict the possibility on what are the low possible low energy effective field theories. So this was quite uh, a topic in modern research. And here in a picture, I put one, uh, one instance of this in the context of searching for quantum gravity theory. Actually, we will not talk about uh, this theory in. Uh, in a uh, in very specific way, but uh, we will consider theory without quantum gravity. But the principle is more or less the same. We imagine to have what is called the swampland of possible low energy effective field theories. And we want to identify those landscapes through which a, a sensible, that I'm gonna define in a second what I mean by this, a sensible UV completion is uh, possible. As I was saying, one could think that the, the free numbers of the model of the low energy theory, the Wilson coefficients or the low energy couplings can be fit from general variance to the experiment, but not all of those will lead to a consistent, let's say in the landscape, effective field theory, so that it can be completed to a sensible UV model. For instance, we could demand, and it is very reasonable, that the UV model is causal and unitary, meaning it respects the causality order of the events, also at a very high energy, and it is conserve or it preserve the probability flow or uh, unitarity. So demanding this is already very constraining on the swampland and it helps to identify landscape of theory in the form of constraints that are mandated from this assumption on the low energy parameters, meaning not all their values will be accessible. And what we do is making progress here deriving what these constraints can be from this, uh, this assumption. As I was saying, this was quite explored in the current literature, literature sorry, and it has, uh, it has achieved some goals. Maybe the most important is that uh, through these, you can rule out some possible in principle IR description. One notable example is the super soft behavior. For instance, amplitude that grow very, very fast with the energy are excluded by these constraints like uh, Galileo, just to quote one. So we do this and what we, we try to, to study and to analyze is uh, the, the, the impact or the possibility of uh, exploiting this personal relation in, on the study of dispersion relation on the scattering amplitudes in order to derive this bounds. And uh, 
This uh, is uh, something that was already explored in different contexts, both assuming causality and arbitrarity in the UV or in the IR. But what we do more is uh, trying to investigate some uh, the effect of strong cabin correction, having in mind the possibility of making some non full non-perturbative statements. Because most of the study is actually uh, carried out on three level or weekly couple approximation. So let's start with a bit of formalism that is needed in order to understand the basic of the thing, which is considering low energy scattering. So the, the way we implement UV assumption on the, on the, low, on the low energy scattering amplitude is through um, some, uh, how to say, assumption. I have to repeat the word, some assumption or imposition on its behavior in the S complex plane. So we consider the two tooth scattering amplitude for scalar sphere. This is the simplest object we can study for, to start. And uh, here, very, very sketchy. We all know that it can be represented by the three Lorentz invariant, taking into account the variable of the scattering and, uh, and in, a, in, in a form of a function that in general depends only on two because they respect for Lorentz invariant this relation that allows to eliminate one or two. So we will consider function of S and T variables. We will generalize this function. We will promote it, just to say, to a, fu a function in the whole complex plane. This is uh, totally reasonable in a quantum mechanical theory. So we will consider the S complex plane and this function here. The assumption that we do in order to implement the possibility that UV theory is causal and unitary is uh, is uh, this, uh, they are summarized this in this, uh, in this list. We will uh, consider the, um, at all energy, of course, at all energy in the whole complex plane, we will consider the, the, all the uh, optical theory to hold, meaning that the imaginary part of the amplitude in the forward limit can be still linked to the cross section. So it has to be positive, in other words. We also uh, define a very peculiar, which is actually, um, the ride from uh, principles, but uh, in this case can be assumed, assuming that those principles those principle also hold in the UV, a very peculiar structure of the singularity of this amplitude. And uh, to be specific, we assume that it has cut above the threshold particle production. If you think of a loop, one loop amplitude, this has log s, that log s minus 4m squared m. That uh, I will tell you in one moment what is this branch. Let's focus on this. And also poles corresponding to propagation of particles in the, in the S matrix. We will not take into account them because they, okay, they don't, uh, they're not relevant for our study. But so for now on, I will consider only branch cut, which is the more relevant. So as I was saying, this is assumed, but it's actually a consequence of very basic property of the S matrix, like uh, factor decomposition and clustering. What we assume also is the very intuitive property that's exchanging in the, in the variables, like for instance, using here, basically this relation to change uh, Yes, to trade as for you is actually leading to a similar pattern, which means generating these other branches. And this corresponds to the fact that exchanging the final initial state in a process uh, like this should not, uh, should not uh, make any difference. And this is the property of crossing. Finally, but very importantly, there is also the property of asymptotic boundedness, which is uh, the fact that the amplitude is not allowed to grow too fast with the energy, meaning that at infinity, it should go to zero slower than S square. All these property actually are used as an assumption to implement the effect or our beliefs on the, UB, on the UV model, like causality and unitarity. So let's give a look on the way, the best, the best very convenient way we've chosen to implement this assumption. We decided to use these variables that are called arcs. I am going to explain you why in a moment. And uh, through this, we can easily derive what are the constraints that this assumption imposes on the low energy scatterings. These arcs are called arcs because they are arcs in the sense that they are integration of the amplitude along these arcs. Center it is minus T over two with a radius that is F zero plus T over two. This is crafted in a way to be crossing symmetric in this variable that is not test, but is being translated. So this arc is taking into account uh, the, if you want the low energy properties of the amplitude. So if you are in effective field theory, you can actually compute this by integration. But very, very interestingly, it has two properties. The first one is that, uh, is a, of course, this maybe is a, a let's just say, that before the first property, it offers a complete parametrization of the scattering. You can capture all the important variables of the scattering. For instance, this can be mapped to the Wilson coefficients or to the or combination of those, meaning that you can capture all the important parameters of the theory. Moreover, they represent a full number Yes. Yes. 
question of notation. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they will, of course, they will. This, uh, because they, they are included, these uh, holes are included, but they, they contribute in a way that is not, uh, that doesn't affect the claim that I'm going to do on these variables. But you are right, of course, they enter this, uh, these, uh, these variables, no, no way. But we will not take into account because it's immediate to insert them. This is what I, what I mean. But of course, you're right. They should be there. They should be placed here um, among the branches. So as I was saying, they are non-perturbative. So in principle, if I don't want to stay on the weakly coupled and include the strongly coupled effect, I could in uh, using just this formula. But the most important thing that is very useful in our goal that is deriving UV property on the low energy scattering is that this can be linked to the, um, the integral of the amplitude along the branch cuts all the way towards uh, very, very high energy. So towards S going to infinity. And this actually allows to connect what is calculable in a low energy effective field theory to what is actually, uh, let's say, something that has to do with the UV theory. So very large energy. They, yeah, let me just keep you very briefly how this happened because we said that the integrals, let's consider this contour. The integral here, it must be zero because there are no singularities apart from the one we are supposed to six. But the larger part of, the, of this uh, contour can be can, can can be can be understood to be zero because uh, when we take an infinite limit as uh, going to infinity, this is going to be suppressed by the boundness we assumed. We can then equate the high hard part of the arcs to the its UV part, meaning the hard can be also represented in this UV, let's say UV representation, where the integral is uh, all above the energy axis, but just of the imaginary part. Okay, the, this is it. So these are the important properties of these uh, variables that we want to use to parameterize the scattering. So let's start to make our job on these and consider a physical laboratory for our, uh, for our uh, study. But before describing uh, yeah, the physical setup, I want to tell you something that maybe is better to, to stress. And it is how these arcs are actually bounded by the property assumed in the UV. They can be bounded easily, and uh, this can be requires a bit of massaging of the formulas, considering the, the following method. We take arcs that uh, depend on S and T and expand around uh, what is the forward limit, so around T equals zero. If we do that, we, uh, this is uh, actually the way the method is designed, uh, and we will see it's going to be a problem, and we will uh, discuss a bit a moment, in a moment when we will see the results. But uh, it will lead to some advantages. And uh, in particular, using partial weight decomposition, like uh, very easily in the UV and defining this average to say on all the UV states propagating, we can see that the arcs and their derivative here indicated by this K comma L can be directly equated in these uh, series of T polynomials to a quantity that are averages or UV, UV the, the, let's say the partial weight, the UV partial weights. And this quantity, they of course are bounded by the assumption on the UV. This is why arcs are suitable to implement our uh, our method. Yeah, you, here if you look uh, if you look uh, with attention, you can recognize the standard positivity bound when the forward limit is taken. Okay, but this is not uh, so important. So this is also why the um, the arcs. This is just a way to show why the arcs are important for this uh, and convenient for this method because they directly implement the bound coming from UV assumption. So let's go to the physical laboratory we want to use to study, to implement these ideas. Before I have to say that uh, I, I mentioned that this could, be generate, could generate some problem in this expansion around the forward limit. And this is because we wanted at the beginning to work in the massless limit. And we will see that these, the fact that the method is designed to work around D equal zero plus the assumption of working with muscle fields will lead to some problem, but we will discuss in a moment. So we stay massless. And we go in our uh, physical setup that is pion scattering. So why pion scattering? This is like the very simple example you can have in mind if you want to study scalar scattering. You have uh, an SU2 symmetry, let's say two flavor pion. And this is interesting also for phenomenology. That could be a possibility given that these arcs are actually non-perturbative. So it could be compared in principle to some experiment on this. Moreover, this has been studied quite extensively in the context of a bootstrap approach to QCD, to QCD in uh, using dispersion relation. So there is also a good rich literature 
of this the study of this um, of this theory in the context of this special relation. So we had some ground to build on. What we've done is considering this scattering at large n. Why? Because large n give a good tool to control the expansion towards non-perturbative correction. This is what we want to reach in the end. So we start from the very simplified model of extremely large limit and then relax this assumption in order to understand what is the contribution of strong coupling effects. So the large n in, uh, in large n, QCD is uh, just to say a theory of weakly interacting mesons. So it's a very easy theory that in the IR can be represented by, for example, the scattering amplitude. I'm gonna tell you more in a second because pions, they just interact at three levels. So the scattering amplitude is a series of contact there. Here you can see, for instance, the, yeah, in one channel, what how it would look like. You have these, I have put this notation in order to reconnect for those who know with the classical chiral perturbation theory. This is the F, the term with S, and this is the classical low energy lex. Just to take the connection with the effective field theory that we discussed in general before, these are of course the low energy effective field theory coefficients, meaning the Wilson, if you want. So these are the objects we want to bound. In this way, they appear quite simply uh, in this very large end limit. These are, to say, the high R simplification of the large end limit. But of course, there are others which are very important. I will uh, just barely mention, briefly mention them. They, they are the fact that uh, now this special relation are applied in a, in a different way with the usual treatment because the absence of exotic mesons um, changes the pattern of cuts of branches in the S complex plane. And this will lead to simplification. And also the boundedness properties relax thanks to an experimental effect of Q, large N QCD or QCD itself, that now the amplitude is supposed to, is supposed, is proven, is test to grow uh, even slower than what we thought. So we start with this, then with a three level study and when we expand with more uh, strong coupling correction. So, what we have a weak coupling. A weak coupling, as we said briefly before, the arcs are just the effective field theory coefficient. So we have that the, um, the quantity computed, as I said before, is now exactly equal to this. And this can be bounded with a wise method and a smart method that is using a numerical procedure. So what we do is identifying some relations that are due to the crossing property of the amplitudes. In particular, this amplitude is uh, symmetric in exchanging of T and S. And this will lead to some relations among the arcs like this, meaning uh, some differences or combination of, arc of arcs can be equated to zero. There are null constraints, so to call them. Here, an example, these two terms have the same coefficients, meaning the arcs, these two arcs, 3, 1, A, 3, 1, or these other arcs, the relative to this term, they actually equal. This is not, of course, the most general possibility. And this is a null constraint on this amplitude. These constraints can be implemented in a procedure called semi-definite optimization that is minimizing the space allow all, all these coefficients in order to keep the assumption we stated at the beginning plus this constraint. And what we derive is the plot here on the left. In the axis, you have the ratios of the arcs or the Wilson coefficients. They are equal in this limit. Dimensionless in the dimensionless uh, fashion, recast in dimensionless fashion. And from here, we see that not all the space is allowed, but just a part of it. In particular, the lighter blue part is the full, let's say, constraint you can have from the UV assumption we made. And the colored one is instead the one you get adding more and more new constraints. Of course, the more you add, the more you are exploiting the power of going to weak coupling. So the better is a bound. What is interesting of this, apart from uh, the fact that not all the space is filled, these are full non-perturbative bound because they are, these are bound on arcs. You don't need weak coupling to the right. You just use weak coupling when you have new constraints. So, and this is something that's worth noticing. Because of this, you could be led to think that, pro that some properties of this plot are actually fundamental. For instance, people have thought that this kink appearing here, this cusps, is actually the position of large NQCD. We will see that uh, strong coupling correction, they may modify the statement and shed light, uh, let's say more light on this, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the sum is over all n, and l is running from zero to n. I didn't specify it because. Uh, yes, but still, you can see that the exactly the circle of the Yeah. The yeah. So if you use the, the, the equation, then we will say the first term is j uh, 3, 2, right? Yeah. 3, 1, 2. 
one. Yeah, you're right. Sorry. Oh, okay. You're perfectly. Yeah. You're perfectly right. No, no. Sorry. No, no. No, no. It's a, no. Sorry. It's not. It's correct. No, because this is. Sorry. This is n. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Ex yeah, exactly. No, this is the very point of the discussion. This should be a different number. While instead they are the same. This is the new constraints. I mean, I'm exploring. Not the new constraints, because then it's like 3, 2 equals what? I mean, 3, 1 equals 2, 1. Yeah, it's this, no? It's not that. Because on, on one side it's 3, 1, on the other side it's 3 minus 1, 1, which is 2, 1. So this, uh, I, I would call uh, 3, 2, right? And then 3, 2, I'm saying that G3, 2 is equal to G3, 1. Yeah, yeah this is 3, 2. Ah, yeah, sorry, pardon, you're right. This is, yeah, you're right. You have to switch these two. You have to, the, the, the mistake is, you're right, there is a typo, sorry for that. The mistake is that you have to switch this with this. So you have to, no, you don't have to switch. You have to put N comma N minus L. And comma and yeah this is what okay. this should i i'm sorry you're right i got wrong here it should be n comma n minus l sorry yeah thank you one i have to fix this sorry you're right it should be n this arc equal to the one with n comma n minus l. yeah thank you for this so uh what i was I, okay i was saying that there are properties in this uh, plot that are interesting but they can be actually just an artifact of this uh, strong weakly coupled approximation. We will uh, explore this possibility by considering strongly coupled correction. So let's go for it. And we add loop in our computations. We are still in the muscle pion, muscleless two flavors pions theory. So we add the effect of loop, which is this. Here hell is the loop coefficient, quantifying loop intensity. And we have this Lagrangian. Now, this, I displayed this before telling you why loops are important apart from the discussion I, we had before, because I want you to notice that we have a log S here. This means that if you, imagine, if you want to use an effective field theory, you are assuming that you are low energy. So not to include the infinite terms of the series I shown at the beginning, but this term is gonna be big at low energy. So you need to take into account when you're going low. So somehow it's important to understand, to study this, to understand where is the trade-off of the energy you, of the low energy you can have in order to make these huge. And this is a, one, another motivation for this study. So once you include this, you can go with the same study we did and compute the arcs again. Now everything is different because the arcs are no more equal to the Wilson coefficients. They pick up terms. In fact, the, the branches you had from the amplitude that are exactly here in the massless case, they now are included in the arc integration and add extra pieces to the Wilson coefficient. Here, I show you one. So the arc is easily modified at the loop level, and we want to understand what is the impact of these terms. Now, at this point, I want you to tell you what is the problem with the forward limit approximation we did. You see, without the mass that I put here, just forget about it, just let's think of this without mass, going in the forward limit will unavoidably generate you some divergences when you consider derivative and t. This is a problem, and is a limitation of the method. Actually, we are expanding on this, considering new methods. There are methods that expand for larger, larger and t, and we are trying to implement it. Or also, we are trying to work at finite mass. But uh, for the moment, just to understand what is the effect of this, we found that it was sufficient to put here a, a cutoff by hand that is adding a mass that is uh, uh, avoiding the forward limit to be dangerous, also in the massless case. So we put the mass here as an IR regulator in order to avoid this. And this is the... The, our results for the arc that we will use in this case. So we perform the study and go on, and we add, um, we add yeah, interestingly, interesting things to study in the methods. In fact, what happens is that the null constraints now receive corrections, and they are no longer as the one you uh, corrected before. They are a bit different, and uh, it's interesting to implement them. And uh, this requires a bit of modification of the algorithm of SDO, and uh, we did this, and in the end, what we get is that are the new bounds on these effective theory coefficients take into account these strong coupling, first strong coupling effects coming from looping the IR. Yeah, just a comment, I could have also relaxed other assumption in the larger limit, the one I made in the UV, but uh, we did, yeah, I'm almost there, this is the last slide. 
may, maybe worth them a minute, but uh, I'm almost there. <laughs> but um, yeah, but in, instead what we did is just relaxing the one in the IR. What we got is this. This is the, the plot, the same plot I showed you before. Just now the black line is the full non-perturbative bound and the color instead that I can show you in a zoom way here represent the effect of loops. We see the loops, not surprisingly, they go against what the weak clapping was doing, recovering the bound as it was in the full non-perturbative case. So they are uh, somehow compensating the effect of strong or new constraints. Here, I also put in evidence what is the effect of having uh, this mass and to show that actually the method has to be refined in order to go, ahead, go on with the study because there really is a strong dependence of the mass that we are actually neglecting working the massless limit. And uh, this is something. The thing that I wanted to stress before uh, going to conclusions is that the kink recognized as a feature, important feature of those uh, of that plot is actually disappearing when the loop are included, meaning that it can only be recognized as an artifact of the weak, extremely weak coupled approximation. So just to conclude, yeah, sorry if I'm a bit uh, late, try to recap a bit and summarize. What we have done is uh, in the context of effective field theory, trying to understand what are the, what are the bounds and how to derive them when uh, the UV theory is uh, constrained using some uh, sensible uh, assumption like causality and unitarity. These are derived through the special relation applied on the scattering amplitude. We decide to do this in the parameterization of arcs, which are very suitable for this being non-perturbative and also, uh, how to say, in uh, making evident the connection between IR and UV physics. We did this in the context of pion scattering. And what we had done is uh, estimating the correction the loops can give to these uh, bounds derived previously just at three level. The things that I need to be improved and that we are currently working on is trying to optimize the method also to be aware, uh, to be, uh, to say not dependent or to, to work fine also outside of the forward limit or to make the computation and try to reproduce the study for greater mass than zero. So in the massive case, that's all for my talk. Thank you very much. Grazie. When there was no typo. Sorry? Uh, could you come back to the slide where there, we thought there was a typo, but the typo was somewhere else? Yes. So I didn't understand why you decide to impose that the two coefficients are the same. This is not imposed. Maybe I, this I didn't explain properly, for maybe. But the thing is that the amplitude comes out naturally like this. If you take yes. pion and you scatter them in the extremely weakly coupled limit, the, these coefficients appear to be equal as a property, as a reflection of the crossing property you have given the flavors. So the ST square exchange is going to be the very same. Yeah, it's going to be the very same as square. We imposed, we imposed this relation when we used the constraining procedure. This is the thing. So these relations, neural constraints are imposed on the- And then you conclude and, the, and then what you have is that they help. They help the bounding process. Now it's clear. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, maybe I, I said the no, quickly. No, 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 but fine. No other questions? Other questions. Very beautiful slide. Oh, thank you. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Right.